Welcome to this audiobook, Soul Side Out Universal Laws to Healing and Living Your Best Life by Summer Bozohora. This audio version of the book, Soul Side Out, includes the first three chapters and an important addendum I've added. The Preface of Soul Side Out Learning to live your life, soul side out. In other words, learning to listen and be guided by your soul to live a healthy, joyful, and meaningful life is a natural process. Relearning this process can be done in five steps and can be easily remembered by the acronym I-N-O-W-T, or Inside Out. The acronym is defined more thoroughly in Chapter 6. Inside Out is a way to be most present, a way to transcend the time-space reality and become a conduit to experiencing the wave function. The aspect of our mind that identifies with oneness, unity, and unconditional love. That part that transforms and heals. The process of healing from the inside out guides one to becoming a witness or observer to your own, your client's or loved one's truth or energy field in a very open, fluid, and creative way. The five-step process of Inside Out is based in 10 universal principles. These laws are defined and concretely laid out through the process and principles described in this book. It is not a process I created, but one I observe as inherent to life. I simply put words to it as instructed and guided intuitively. The universal laws are reflected in the ideas and principles of quantum science. And I've written this book with the goal of bridging the ideas of science and spiritual understanding in a simple new way. I speak purely from my personal experience in life. My educational background includes psychology, counseling, and art therapy, some medicine and alternative health therapies, and even by some luck, optical and optometric understandings. I chose not to enter any of these specific fields for fear of being boxed in, in a way that my soul could not bear. None of these professions or their code of ethics were close enough to resonate with what I believe the creator's intended laws for true healing are. What I am is a renegade artist, thought leader, spiritual teacher, and intuitive healer. I believe that the evolution of human consciousness is advanced through the unseen webs of soul-based information, or what Carl Jung would have described as the collective unconscious. My expertise is other than traditional, and I share my personal expertise so those who find meaningful passages within this book can use it for their own personal healing. When reading about my experience and my opinions, I ask that you, the reader, also claim for yourself the power of your own authority. Please take only that which resonates within yourself as true, such that it helps you to understand your own life's experiences and live an authentic life. Note, throughout this book, I have little stopping points called reflections. There, you'll find suggested questions for your consideration, the answers to which may lead you to understanding your inner truths. For a more interactive and deeper learning experience with this book, pause and take time to journal your answers. Chapter 1 of Soul Side Out, Breaking Down My breaking down, or what I might call my healing crisis, or awakening, began for me in India at the age of 24. During my studies for my bachelor's degree in business, I applied to travel and work on an exchange program, something I'd been hoping for since high school, but was not allowed to do. India was not a country of my choosing, but I believe India chose me. I don't know why or how I was matched with India, but it came down to either I could go, despite my reservations and anxiety, 
or I would miss the opportunity to travel. So I went. Before I traveled to India, life in my rich suburban community was about as flavorful as eating cardboard, stiff and tasteless. Yet somehow people chose to live there, drawn like those fooled by the flashy activity of a Las Vegas cafe selling false promises. My community was one of the wealthiest in North America. Through my teen years and into my early 20s, I lived on an acreage surrounded by large homes and mansions, many with private indoor pools. The small community high school housed 200 students. Teenage girls are clicky by nature, often driven by a sense of entitlement among some rich girls and playing on the natural state of insecurity that the age brings. The air seemed thick and suffocating, filled with personal and group tension. As cliques work, my refusing to be a part of them made me a target. I was taunted, teased, beaten up at school, and had the tires of my car slashed. Our community could have had a reality show or soap opera created from its dramatic nature. There was a higher than average number of deaths and suicides. One distinct memory is of a neighbor, a plastic surgeon. When I was 16, my family was invited over for appetizers and to share a drink or two or three. We toured his large home and were led to the balcony to share appetizers and conversation. I remember him telling me how he could fix the dimple on the bottom of my nose. I wasn't even aware of it until he suggested he could fix it as if it was an unsightly and abhorrent flaw on my face. I was taken aback. Finding his comet extremely shallow, based on his personal viewpoint of beauty, perhaps he thought me a potential client with wealthy parents who would see the value of such superficial surgery. At that moment, I was quiet. I said absolutely nothing because I was stunned and didn't know what to say. My look and my silence spoke for me. I was aghast, and my quiet rejection of the offer for services changed the feeling tone of our exchange. The conversation with me began in his role as a successful plastic surgeon with a lucrative career and something to offer me. My quiet rejection left a need for him to pursue a different avenue if he were to connect with or impress me. Some people, those immersed in the outside markers of success in their lives, wouldn't care about my young perspective. But that was not the case with him. In that moment, I felt he respected me, and at the same time had an undeniable and desperate need for my approval, which left me feeling a strong sense of aversion and disgust towards him. The energy of that exchange was very strong. And at the age of 16, I didn't know what he was seeking from me. Looking back, it seems that my strong sense of self-worth, my unshakable belief that my dimple was absolutely fine with me, triggered an emptiness within him. What happened the next day was shocking, but not surprising. He killed himself and was found in a room of his house. That this tragedy happened soon after I felt his desperate need for my approval has never left my mind. Because of the feeling tone I sensed from him on the day of our exchange, his suicide made sense to me. Being 16, I could not put into words what I felt before the tragedy occurred. Years later, I understand that outside appearances masked an inner turmoil of meaninglessness. From the outside looking in at the conversation, he looked proud of his home and confident and self-assured speaking about plastic surgery, his field of expertise. Yet a day later, he left it all behind. Aside from acknowledging that he had died, my parents never discussed it with me. Nothing was ever said about anyone's perceptions, ever. That would be far too uncomfortable a conversation. I have forgotten about this experience for different lengths of time, but the energetic impression was stamped into the understanding of life and my knowing.
On the outside, the members of the rural community I lived in seemed wealthy. On the inside, its inhabitants were often suffering and depraved. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread. The poverty in the West is a different kind of poverty. It's not only a poverty of loneliness, but also of spirituality. There is a hunger for love, as there is a hunger for God. Mother Teresa, Fox, 1991. This, quote, rich, end quote, culture was my normal. And although I often felt something was missing in my life, and although I felt something was missing in my life, I only knew this way of life. The ways our culture shapes us are so integral to our lives that how we think seems perfectly natural. So deeply embedded in our lives are the ways of our culture that changing them is often difficult. Fancher, 1995. Had I not traveled to India and been subjected to the immense cultural discordance from a familial but also societal perspective, I would never have written this book. I could not possibly understood all the layers of reality that were unveiled to me without unembedding myself from my own culture. India's aromas, fresh herbs and spices, garbage and flowers, and the bright colors of silks awakened my senses. The deeply ornate temples of prayer and carefully constructed altars piqued my curiosity. As a child of an atheist and an agnostic, there was no mention of God or spirit in our home. So the idea of prayer was new to me. My Indian family. My hosts, an Indian family of four, were gracious, poor, and yet particularly generous and kind. My auntie and uncle, adults are referred to this in India, who were of a similar age to my own parents, gave up their sleeping area for me. Although they were a couple, they chose to sleep on a single bed. I was aghast, but unwilling to challenge my adult hosts, being most unsure of the cultural protocols. I was given the nicest and largest bed and the only wardrobe space they owned. They had few other possessions, only two kitchen chairs and a small table. They often sat on the floor in a room with no other furniture but their carefully constructed altar in a corner of the room. Their unquestionable generosity left me baffled. I came from an affluent country where many of my friends or their children would not share their bedroom nor be so hospitable. Yet here, they put me in a private room and bathroom and treated me, it seemed, as if I were royalty. I was the only white person in the town and I rode to work sitting in the women's section at the front of the bus. Despite there being standing room only and people being jam-packed like sardines, I had a seat to myself. I was left sitting alone. I startled one young girl terribly when she sauntered up to the seat beside me. She let out a scream when she laid her eyes on what must have looked like a very ugly and ghostly person. At five or six years old, this girl had never seen a foreigner before. At my home in India, I observed rats climbing around our yard and up into the large garbage pile. No one paid any mind. I watched our maid, who came from a much lower caste than my hosts, wash my clothes by beating them against a large rock not far from the garbage pile. I could not believe my eyes. My travels throughout India brought me face to face with extreme poverty. I saw children with broken legs begging for money. I was told that parents would sometimes break their children's legs so the children could bring in more money. I would never have imagined the kind of desperation that would make a parent do such a thing. It was a brutal reminder that I came from a very different background. The discordance I felt between India's culture and my own initiated a flow of awareness I could not contain. I had no distractions, no TV, no telephone, no friends, except for my Indian family, 
and no access to any substances that might help me deny or avoid the onslaught of suppressed memories. Unconscious beliefs, perceptions, and childhood traumas began to bubble up to the surface of my consciousness. I began to read, reflect, and journal for the first time in my life. I began to enjoy my time alone, and the flow of awareness was both challenging and refreshing. While this new awareness was rising within me, I got a call from home that my parents had chosen to get a divorce and were separating. Hearing the news shocked me, but I was ready to go home. My plane ride back to Canada. During the 24-hour flight home from India back to Canada, my childhood eczema flared up covering my body. As I sat on the plane, anxiously anticipating my arrival home, I vigorously scratched my elbow folds. The skin was fragile and it was so itchy. I scratched my arms to the point of bleeding and within a day, one of the openings in my skin developed a large boil the size of a golf ball and just as hard. At the time, I was unaware of the emotional upheaval surging up from the depths of my soul, unaware that my physical symptoms had any relationship to anything but the surface of my skin. I was given a series of tests by infectious disease specialists at the hospital to determine the cause of the infection and the boils. They told me they had no real explanation for it. My immune system seemed normal, and they told me I would likely have to keep taking antibiotics and have this issue for the rest of my life. I was stunned. These specialists could not help me. I was given several prescriptions for antibiotics to rid me of the boils and the streptococcal blood infection causing them. When I took the antibiotics, the boil on the surface of my skin receded only to be followed by another as soon as I finished taking the medicine. Within our healthcare system, the solution for what ails us is often some form of drug. There's not much else, at least not in conventional medicine. The idea is to fight or kill whatever invades our body. In chapter three, I will talk about this very interesting fear-based paradigm for treating illness and disease. After several new boils and rounds of antibiotics, I began searching for information to explain what was going on in my body. Although I don't remember the book or where I located the passage that shifted my awareness, I do remember that boils and the green pus that oozed from them represented long-held, repressed anger erupting through the surface. Aha, that's it. My whole body responded with an undeniable yes. The feeling was so strong. I knew it was confirming a truth within me. I had been holding anger and confusion in my body for years. It was finding its way out as I journaled, dreamed, sketched out and scribbled my body sensations, emotions, memories, and images. I began to trust my body and what it was telling me. I refused the last antibiotics prescribed for me and haven't had a boil since. The healing went deeper. I stopped having issues with eczema altogether, and it had been a lifetime chronic issue. As I began healing myself, my body, my distorted beliefs and emotional traumas, I was called to work with others. I began counseling training and volunteering at the 24-hour crisis center. On the 24-hour crisis line, I came to understand more about human crisis, people's fragility, and the scope of our human suffering. Reflection break, question one. Have you ever had a symptom or body pain that spontaneously changed or resolved without medical attention? If so, recall what it was and what was going on in your life at the time.
Chapter 2 of Soul Side Out Breaking Open Navigating Yourself to Greater Health Your Health Provider's Perspective In my own life struggles, emotional and physical, I learned one of the most important aspects of healing is choosing the right person to help you navigate through your experience to greater health. How well we recover, grow, or heal depends on knowing what we need and matching that to the person from whom we seek guidance. It is important to understand the care provider's perspective because there are many different models, theories, and approaches to health care. Being aware of this wide menu of views about health when choosing who and how they may help us is vital in preventing harm. Personally, I first sought help by consulting a psychologist. There wasn't a lot of thought behind my decision. I just wanted help navigating a very confusing part of my life. As I began to make sense of my suppressed anger, memories, and confusion, I found myself lost in an identity crisis. I was unable to relate naturally to people felt very insecure and often overwhelmed with emotion and fear. During my life, I may have been able to be labeled with one diagnosis or another, or been prescribed drugs, but I had not. And because I had not, the psychologist I chose questioned the validity of my life history. She was unable to understand how I could have gotten through my family history and childhood sexual abuse without using drugs. She never asked me how I did cope. Instead, the psychologist dismissed my experience as false. I was shocked, disgusted, and grateful that my internal compass was strong enough to keep me from collapsing under her care. My truth was questioned because I had not taken drugs that a mental health professional believed necessary in cases of trauma and abuse. She practiced from this perspective, and because I did not fit what she believed to be true, she invalidated my experience. This was not helpful for my healing, but it did make me aware of what I didn't want as I searched other solutions to maintain my sanity. Reflection break. Question one, what kind of care have you sought? Question two, was it helpful? Did it help you process the meaning of your symptoms at a deep level or did it skim the surface? Question three, or was the care you received harmful in some way? My primary way of coping was to dive into my inner world. I explored my newly discovered world and found it rich and meaningful. Imagery, art, and journaling, the type one might call spirit speak or automatic writing, oozed effortlessly out of me, healing me on the way. Through my personal healing experience, I was drawn to re-enroll in university. This time I entered a visual arts program preparing for a degree in art therapy. Artistic expression, color, my dreams and my journals saved me. They gave me a place to go to gain insight and piece together my fractured self. My memories before the age of five had been a complete blank, but the pages of my journals begin to fill with them. Through my dreams and artwork, Memories and body sensations began to surface, and so did my energetic, intuitive awareness. I became aware of being sexually abused as a child. At a young age, I was molested by a family friend. Fortunately for me, it was not a repeated occurrence. I saw the perpetrator several years later. I was traveling on a summer vacation with my family and ended up stopping for a swim in an outdoor pool. This person owned the pool. 
Although I was unable to verbally express my feelings or consciously remember the circumstances that created the rage I felt towards this person, my body's emotional, energetic relay system chose a very clear message. I deliberately shat in the swimming pool with a sense of great satisfaction. While the little brown floaters I created bobbed around in the pool, I pretended I had no idea how they got there. I was older than the other children in the pool, so I knew I was less likely to be suspected as the culprit. Pooping in the pool was the only way I could safely communicate my feelings. Looking back, I see it was a very clever way to mirror the secrecy of the perpetrator's behavior toward me. The catch-all term for many of these events in our lives is trauma. Many of us have these types of distorted, twisted energetic histories embedded on a cellular level within our bodies. The energetic threads go back generations and generations, enduring through the ages of our ancestors, through world wars and bombings, violence and unspeakable abuses. As subtle or hidden the effects may seem to be, we are affected. These things may be hidden from open speech in our daily activities, but the effects of past events matter. Many human experiences are energetically wreaking havoc within our bodies, minds, and souls, festering in the unconscious collective of our human psyche. I've had my share of dramatic life experiences. War, addictions, abuses, and atrocities are extreme. But any kind of untruth, secret, or hiding is a distortion of the truth and disconnects us from our inner knowing. As babies and children, we are spongy, absorbent, energetic beings. It is easy to absorb the anger, confusion, depression, and worthlessness of others as if it were our own. Doing this for prolonged periods of time, without any tools with which to circumvent the effects, distorts our perceptions and feeling about the world and ourselves. Many symptoms, illnesses, diseases, and visual blurs are often really a clever way to mirror a sense of internal distortion and disconnection from the universe, creator, higher purpose, or God. The symptom imperative. Dr. John E. Sarno has created a term I think that is very important for people to know. The term is the symptom imperative. The symptom imperative operates within a series of disorders that fall within an area of study or referred to as psychosomatic medicine. In his books, The Divided Mind and The Epidemic of Mind-Body Disorders, Dr. John Sarno describes psychosomatic disorders is falling into two categories. The first, those disorders that are directly induced by unconscious emotions, such as pain problems, including, but not limited to back pain and migraine headaches, and common gastrointestinal conditions, including reflux, ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, skin disorders such as eczema, allergies, and many others. Category two, diseases in which unconscious emotions play a role, but are not the only factor, including autoimmune disorders, cardiovascular conditions, and cancer. Sarno, 2007. To these two categories specified by Dr. Sarno, I would add a third, vision problems. The need for glasses, blurred vision, strabismus, and amblyopia, otherwise known as lazy eye. Degenerative eye diseases and inflammatory conditions influenced by autoimmune disorders are also affected by unconscious emotions or what we do not want to see. The purpose of the symptom imperative is to distract the conscious mind from what we've been taught are unacceptable or undesirable feelings or expressions. 
The type of symptom and its location in the body is not important so long as it fulfills the purpose of diverting attention from what is transpiring in the unconscious. Every condition in our lives exists because there's a need for it in one way or another, either on the time-space level or on the soul level. A specific sickness is the natural specific outcome of specific thought patterns and or emotional disharmonies. Illness, ailments, disorders, and diseases represent the final warning system. They are coded messages from the body to the effect of what is happening and what needs to happen. In effect, then, illnesses and ailments teach us, expand us, and move us on. Tulsa, 1991. Illness and even injuries do not start with physical symptoms. They begin long before the physical symptoms show up. At times, it can start energetically even before we are born, within the energetic field of our family in which we are born into. These illnesses, symptoms, etc. may not even be about our energy, thoughts, or emotions in this life. The symptoms may emerge as part of an energetic pattern that has been pre-established through the genetic field and perpetuated through the unchanged emotional and psychological reactions of the parents and societies who unconsciously perpetuate certain patterns. We belong. We belong to a matrix of human consciousness. To believe, act, and treat conditions as if the context and culture with which these conditions arise are not part of a condition's manifestation is a form of blindness or insanity. Dr. Sarno calls this lack of awareness the not including unconscious emotions as potential risk factors in these types of disorders, criminal. In our culture, it is far more acceptable to talk about and address physical pain than it is emotional pain. This starts when we are children. As human beings, we have a universal desire for connection and to be deeply nurtured by our parents or someone within the community to which we're born. We need to know that others care and that we have an effect on our world based on our existence. If we cannot get the sense that we belong and are important emotionally, often the next best way to get attention is through physical symptoms or pain. In the context of our historically emotionally repressed culture, parents are more able to respond to physical pain or symptoms. It's easier to attend to children when their pain is physical and visible. Physical symptoms can be attended to without disturbing or awakening the parents' repressed feelings or unresolved traumas, and children can get the attention they crave. Unfortunately, restraining our deepest held emotional and spiritual yearnings for life and hiding them through physical symptoms distorts our life energy and has long-term consequences. No matter how we attempt to separate the mind and body or try to placate the body's symptoms, our attempts eventually stop working. The collapse of this mechanism most often occurs under stress or pressure and results in a migraine headache, emotional or nervous breakdown, burnout, accident or injury, or life or health crisis. Under these circumstances, Defenses can drop, and the mind can no longer be tricked into believing the emotions are not there. The energy of the psyche and the soul can no longer be physically repressed. Because the body is like a diverter or relay system meant as the divine channel of communication between our soul and our physical reality, it's only a matter of time before symptoms appear that begin to call us toward a more integrated mind-body experience of life. This is because as human beings, whether we are aware of it or not, we are constantly asking questions about life and death, its meaning and purpose. And there is nothing that calls life's meaning and purpose into question as much as personal crisis or illness, because they strike to the core of what we believe about life. 
The Paradigm of Self-Healing Once I presented an introductory self-healing collegium to my peers, theology students. Many of them were chaplains, ministers, nurses, and counselors. One of them asked the most important question that arises when people consider what self-healing means. What do you say to a client who is dying, whose peers, church, and family members tell them that they aren't praying hard enough? She continued, if they are told they can self-heal, won't they blame themselves for their experience, disease, or illness? My answer was yes. Often people do accept blame. However, blame is a concept that arises within a particular belief system. Blame, judgment, and punishment coexist within a belief system that sees God or the creator is outside of oneself and more powerful than oneself. It views God as punishing and to be feared. This type of relationship with source makes us feel helpless, insignificant, and fearful. Thus, if a client accepts blame for their state of health, they inevitably believe that something about themselves is wrong or bad. As a result, one prays harder, begs and pleads, because we believe ourselves powerless. What if the universe supports you? What if you're safe no matter what? What if your energy is an integral part of the universe? Why then are you experiencing your symptoms or life situation? Is there a deeper, richer meaning besides the idea that your symptoms or some part of you is wrong or undeserving? Self-healing presumes the essential strength, wisdom, and integrity of people who live in a life of service to source. Many spiritual traditions of the world know this inner resilience and call it by many names. Inner light, essential essence, still point, soul, and holy spirit to name a few. Finally, life and health includes death. Death is a completion, not a punishment. We all die. It just depends on why, how, and when. Many would find it ideal to die of natural causes, feeling ready to transition and leave our bodies after a long, good life. Most of us probably would like to die without pain, with peace in our hearts, and at a time we feel we've come to completion with our chosen life path and goals. Our fear of death often has more to do with not feeling at peace with our why, how, and when. We get so busy doing other things and focusing on external goals, distractions, or pursuits that we can be surprised when what appears to be a sudden health condition sneaks up on us. The truth is, though, if we are aligned with our soul during life, we will also be at peace with death. During our lifetime, if we believe our soul is innately radiant, when we sink into our quiet inner realm, we are filled with peace. If, however, we fear our inner world because it may show us our brokenness, flaws, and failures, we avoid it. A common fear of stopping our busy lives and listening to our inner realm is because of what we believe we will find there. If we believe we are not good or whole inside, we may be reluctant to stop and rest afraid we will find a lurking emptiness, a terrible, aching void that nothing can fill. This wide open inner space can feel like an abyss that is in opposition to all that is visible and safe. So we may choose to remain in the realm of form with things we can see and touch and that we perceive are subject to our control. So we quickly fill all the blanks in our calendar with tasks, accomplishments, and errands to fill the time and space. The story of my plastic surgeon neighbor is not unusual. Many people lead lives working and believing they need to continue in soul-sucking positions or relationships that slowly wear them down until they realize they are unhappy and sick. 
with my clients, if for a moment I see this fear, it excites me because I know what is around the corner. They have found the creative void of emptiness, which is richly fertile with potential. When this happens, it is as if they enter a field of being, a universal creative process in which willing explorers are able to tame their inner demons, regardless of how big, ferocious, or deep their doubt, sorrow, fear, or loss is. The creation that happens within the stillness of our inner world does more than just allow one to bear life. Creation is unlimited. It is infinite in its possibilities, and these same possibilities are intrinsic to each individual. When people embrace the principles of wholeness, it awakens a life-serving energy that motivates and sustains them. Life events are guidance tools, not punishments, and there are always signs and opportunities that allow you to find the answers you seek. It's just that sometimes we are creatures of habit or comfort. In the following section, two women have written their stories, in their own words, of what it took to transform their illnesses and live from the soul side out. Addiction as a Soul Sickness Jill Sidero I think in life there are opportunities called wake-up calls. They don't often feel like opportunities at the time. The biggest wake-up call for me was finally seeing through the haze, pain, denial and loneliness to realize that I was in the throes of active addiction and all the hurt and suffering it causes. Not me, wealthy housewife, mother of three, educated, spiritual. It wasn't until I had already committed to a healing path and all the stuff that it brings up that I began to open up the energetic and emotional pain held in my body. Past trauma, false beliefs and fear drove my insane thinking and the feeling that there was an emptiness deep within me where my soul should be. I grew up in a stable and loving home at first. The first trauma was the death of my brother when I was young. The memory of that day and the pain I experienced witnessing my parents' despair and seeing him away seared into my mental, physical, and emotional body. I'm sure that was the beginning of what would, over three decades later, be identified as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and generalized anxiety disorder. In the interim, I grew up thinking there was something wrong with me. When I was in elementary school, my father began drinking and using drugs, and the violence, insanity, and lack of safety and stability began. I remember one night as he rampaged through the house, shock waves of pain surged down my arms and jarred into my hands. I felt the anger and hurt surging through my body and I clenched my fists. I'm sure it happened many times, but I recall that night, both the pain and the power. It felt like it was the only power I had. It felt like a defiance that was all mine, and I wanted to hold on to it. I was empowered by my anger, even if it meant turning it on myself. Fifteen years later, I was diagnosed with osteoarthritis in my hands, way too young for my age, and I'm sure that it was related to that holding on to emotional and energetic pain I had experienced all those years before. It was still there and was finally manifesting physically. As systems go in families who face issues like mine did, everyone adopts a particular role. Mine was to fix things and to make sure everything was taken care of and under control. I felt insane. The problem was that I didn't realize the insanity was the situation, not me. A lot of what drove my addiction was emotional pain and growing up in a codependent alcoholic family and not having anyone who could help me understand my thoughts or support a healthier way for me to cope. I became proficient at separating from my body and the emotional effort and energy it required. I often couldn't even feel my body anymore, except for the pain. 
I sometimes still struggle with the physical aspect today. Back then, emotion rode in waves, and I was like an inexperienced surfer carried away on a surfboard. My thoughts ran wild, and I was out of control riding the waves. My body hurt with shame, guilt, anger, fear, and self-loathing. I didn't know how to define all of this at the time. Drinking was a natural means of coping. It was the model I had grown up with, and it was the legacy passed down through generations in my family. I drank as much as possible in my teens and during university, but I thought I knew better than to fall into the trap of alcoholism. I was able to choose not to drink while I was pregnant or during the early years of my children's lives. Then the day came when I decided I want to drink socially again. I made the decision and I heard an inner voice say, without any judgment, but as a truth and acknowledgement, that I would be an alcoholic. I even looked around when I heard the voice because it was so loud. Then I shrugged my shoulders and off I went. I think many of us have inner voices we often disregard. Some may be inaudible or subtle, but I distinctly remember this one. Looking back, if the voice was that loud, maybe I could have had a conversation with that part of me, that inner voice. I didn't want to hear it though. I didn't have time. I had things I wanted to do, goals to accomplish. My ego won out and I dampened that inner voice. This began a decline over the years until I became very ill, although many people still didn't know. It's amazing how well it can be hidden. My marriage was, of course, affected, and I decided to take my husband to a counselor because he needed fixing. My counselor was a gift. Along with her counseling degrees and extensive experience in her field, she had a theology degree spiritual gifts, and she recognized the soul connection in healing. She looked over her eyeglasses one day and asked me, perhaps next time, I'd like to discuss my primary relationship, which was the alcohol. This comment hit something within me and took my breath away. That is when things began to change. She sparked my awareness of a problem I just couldn't ignore. The seed was planted and my journey to healing began before I even realized it had. It wasn't my husband who needed to be fixed. That part was none of my business. It was me, my wounded self that needed self-care, acknowledgement and new strategies. I learned that it's okay to say I'm struggling. I finally became a tad willing and more honest with myself. These two seeds, willingness and honesty, would be what moved mountains for me. I had done some counseling before, but now I had to become vulnerable and open. It didn't come without resistance, but finally I was ready to see, and the universe unfolded easily with resources and opportunities for help and healing. It's a good thing I accepted them. The support I received was not from the places I expected. It wasn't from my mom or my husband. I had to challenge my childhood learning and beliefs. Things like, you don't get help. Psychologists are stupid and you absolutely do not take meds because it means you're weak. The message was that I needed to figure out my own stuff. It's my problem. It's my attitude and my fault. Finally, I took a stand for my own needs and did what was right for me, no matter what others thought. I realized that I was dying, no one was getting it, and it was really serious. I went away to a recovery center for five weeks. I chose to step out of the life I knew and back into me. It wasn't easy. I was scared people would find out and judge me but somehow I was given the strength to do it anyway. This pivotal decision would be much further reaching than I could have ever imagined. It was the most self-honoring act of love I have ever done for myself, and the hardest one. 
My inner little girl needed to be heard and to heal. Taking time for my addiction opened the doors to all the other underlying issues. This became the path to healing on all levels, a journey I continue today. Addiction is known as a soul sickness. When I asked how I would define soul, the first response is an unemotional one. When one has felt they have lost their soul and the void is so great, the gift of retrieving it is the most profound joy. It has been a big part of my life to get to know my soul and to embrace all of my humanness, even the undesirable parts. I knew my soul when I was a little girl. I know her again now. I think I came here to know my soul. One must know how it feels to be without it, to deeply recognize what it feels like to find it. For me, the soul is a hereness. All other things drop away. In my soulfulness, there's no judgment that I'm not good enough or worthy enough. There's no fear. There's no elation either. There just is. It's not the same void I experienced in addiction. This void is a sense of being whole rather than fragmented. In my average day, when I feel connected with my soul, there's peace, acceptance, and possibility. Emotions like grief and anger come, but only as experiences rather than states of being that I get caught up in. I feel connected and safe when I feel my soul. My ego is taking a time out on the bench and I can put my arm around it and we can laugh together at the crazy ego shit we did today. How human. Before my healing and meeting my soul again, I never felt like I belonged. Not in my body, not in this world. My thoughts and emotions were torrents and I was just trying to survive. This has invited me to go deep within, to the eye of the storm, and discover who and what I am. The greatest gift in my healing has been connection. Today I am recovered. I must keep a spiritual connection to stay well, and I have to be in contact with all parts of myself. My body is healthy, especially considering the amount of anxious energy it naturally holds, and the arthritis in my hands has progressed at a very slow rate. I usually don't even notice it's there. I still tend to put myself last at times. It's sometimes natural for me not to bother taking care of myself in subtle, nurturing ways. My mind and body sometimes still feel detached. I know I'm detached when my mind gets too focused. I hold my breath and my body tenses up. It's like my mind doesn't want to pause to attend to the rest of me. But when I sit and choose to feel my body, my mind reconnects with it. During my life, my body has not felt like a priority. For most of my life, it was like a dumping ground for unexpressed or unacceptable feelings. As I grew, what I noticed is that when significant adults in my life, such as teachers, mentors, or family members didn't acknowledge or respond appropriately when I would tell them something confusing or violent happened, I felt an incredible amount of distrust and fear. I felt unsafe. So much fear arose in me and couldn't be vented. There was no place for the energy to move, so it got sucked inward. For me, it was a powerful sense of anger and defiance that I carried and held in my body. This type of anger turned inward towards oneself disconnects us from our true nature. I found my spiritual and healing path to be quite pragmatic and practical. I have to show up, get conscious, and do things that keep me connected and in service. I've had to learn to care for myself deeply and not live my life to please others or to fulfill an idea I have of what I should be. I'm still a work in progress, of course, but working on myself and getting help doing it is the best thing I've ever done. 
It hasn't been easy, but it has been worth it. I often feel joy in the moment, even at unusual times, like when I'm under a lot of stress. There is a tremendous faith in living that comes with having a joyous moment just because you're present to experience it. When I feel off, I know it will pass and I can do something useful to help someone in the meantime. Through my lived experience, I believe I'm asked to form a relationship with every aspect of life and myself. I was in so much mental, emotional, physical and spiritual pain that I pursued an unconscious life through substance, shopping and people pleasing. I've had to choose a conscious life to get well. I began to observe things, how I feel and think in response, and negative emotions and energy lose their power. The gift has been healing and better mental, emotional, and physical health. When I get right down to it, I think the only thing that really matters is connection to my authentic self and therefore also to the authentic nature of others. There's a sense of overwhelming love. Fear can be mixed in as I still have it, but I get better at watching it all and knowing none of it defines me. I simply can observe the energy and let it go. This has been a process of learning to live in the moment and gain connection and awareness. I see addiction and codependence as being out of alignment and not in true connection with oneself or others. I am grateful to be learning to embrace the unknown, trust my life, and appreciate every one of my experiences. I wouldn't be me without them, and I wouldn't change a thing about my journey. For me, this has become an immense feeling of purpose and a life well lived. Soul Alignment, Essentials to My Healing, Michelle Enns. I have personally transformed my life and have overcome traumatic experiences by using various techniques of energy healing. It took me over 20 years of suffering before I turned to energy work as a way to heal. I write this now to raise awareness of how healing involves not just the physical, but also the mental, emotional, and spiritual components of a whole being. I grew up in a dysfunctional family dealing with alcoholism, divorce, poverty, and a father who worked away. I remember being angry, disappointed, thought that life was unfair, and blamed my parents for how I felt in life. An only child, I primarily felt lonely and alone. In order to succeed in school and university, I had to shut off my emotions and memories from childhood and focus on my studies. I thought I put it behind me, but never really acknowledged the emotions I had. As an adult, I struggled with chronic migraines for over 20 years, infertility for eight, grief and severe stress. I left work on a stress leave and was diagnosed with major depression and anxiety, which I lived with for over 15 years. I tried several types of medication and was forced to go to group therapy. During that time, the only real awareness I noticed was that I was super angry at my father and expressed it a little in some exercises. The depression and anxiety remained. My health continued to deteriorate. I saw medical doctors and had tons of tests that ruled out everything they knew of and by default and by default they determined I had symptoms of both chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. I was told there was nothing that could be done for it. After a few years of that, I turned to a naturopathic doctor who discovered that I had chemical toxicity. There were plastics, insecticides, herbicides, and air pollutants such as cigarettes and diesel, mercury, and lead in my blood. I began detoxifying and a year later was diagnosed with breast cancer. I received vitamin injections and ozone therapy, which helped tremendously, and I chose to have a mastectomy. 
A year later, I still wasn't bouncing back, and I started wondering if I should address the emotional issues of my past rather than only focusing on physical symptoms. I asked my naturopathic doctor his opinion of how much he thought emotions contributed to health. He said, at least 40%. And as I researched, I found that some specialists say emotions and stress were 80% or more responsible for our health, illness, and physical symptoms. Dr. Bradley Nelson, who wrote The Emotion Code, and Dr. Warren Weissman, developer of the Lifeline Technique, have these things to say. 90% of all pain that we experience is due to trapped emotions, to emotional baggage, and those emotions stay with us and cause our disease and much of our self-sabotage. Nelson, 2013. The core of every symptom, stress and disease are emotions, memories and traumatic perceptions that are buried in our subconscious mind. Weissman, 2013. For me, cancer was a blessing and a wake up call that prompted me to start taking control of my own life and healing. I researched, radically changed my diet, and learned that we need to detox physically and emotionally. The AMA, American Medical Association, says that 80% of all health issues are stress-related. Dr. Joe Dispenza, a neuroscientist and author, says, Humans can turn on the stress response by thought alone. Our thoughts create our emotions, which create chemistry in our bodies. It is a fact that the chemicals of stress dysregulate and downregulate our genes that create disease. If we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone, and those chemicals can make us sick, then by very definition, our thoughts can make us sick. From the movie Emotion from Gaia.com, 2013. The realization that our thoughts and emotional baggage from our past can make us sick led me to energy work and my journey to heal myself through training as an energy healer. There are many techniques and aspects to energy healing, but I will share some basic skills that others can easily learn and practice to create change and open awareness in their lives. The first step in my training was learning to open my heart and feel unconditional love. As I learned to open my heart, connect to pure divine love, and practice various energy healing techniques, healing occurred. The power of love heals. Love is the basis of energy healing. A field of love in, on, and around the body lifts and removes the lower, heavy, dense energy of negative emotion from us. We feel lighter, more open, uplifted and free. As a facilitator of energy healing, I now hold that field of love for clients to assist in their healing. The second step in my training as an energy healer was to discover my own emotional patterns and, through various techniques, transform unhealthy patterns into healthier patterns through love. This meant accepting, honoring, and trusting what I could feel and see when I turned my attention inward and began observing myself. I learned that we memorize thoughts and emotions in our subconscious and they're stored in our bodies. I noticed that these emotional patterns in my body tended to be released in layers. For example, I was really angry and resentful at my husband and felt unsupported. As I transformed this emotional pattern by observing it, without judgment, I came to realize that I also felt angry and unsupported by colleagues, past friends, all the way back to my parents as a small child. Each of these layers needed to be looked at, observed, accepted, and loved. Recognizing these sensations, I could connect to divine love and light, focus on those painful, tight, or discomforted parts of my body, with unconditional love in those locations. Often that would release and transform those dense, heavy patterns into a lighter, more open and flowing energy, giving me relief. 
Sometimes just knowing where in the body wasn't enough. Sometimes just knowing where in my body wasn't enough to clear or transform the pattern. My soul wanted me to become more aware of and have greater insight about the pattern so I could learn from it. If I recognized a tight or painful part in my body, I connected to a feeling of divine love and with focused intention, awareness and observation, I could ask questions. I could ask what emotions were stuck there or ask for any other insight. As I remained open to the insights it offered, the tightness or pain would often release. For example, I had a lot of disappointment, sadness, and heartbreak in my chest area. That gave me insight into a past trauma with my husband, old boyfriends, childhood friends, and my parents as a young child. I could then release and transform the whole pattern with unconditional love. As I became aware of how emotional patterns work, I could use what thoughts or emotions were bothering me in the present and trace those emotional patterns back in time to find their cause and release them on an energetic level. For example, I often felt alone and lonely throughout my life. One day when I felt lonely, I asked where in my body I felt the pattern of loneliness. I became aware of and recognized a tight sensation in my chest. I asked it questions like, who did I pick up this energy from? How old was I when that happened? Are there any other emotions tied to it? And is there anything else I need to know? I received the insight that I picked up the emotion from my mother when I was two years old. At that time, we had moved away from the family to be with my dad, who worked up north on the oil rigs. My mom was alone with me each day and many nights without family or friends to support her. That emotion was not even originally my own thought, but as a child, I absorbed it from my mother and it was triggered many times throughout my life. With awareness and insight, I could then accept it and feel love again. Each time a symptom developed, my body was communicating to me and showing me that something wasn't right. There was something that wasn't aligned with my own truth and authentic self, who I really am on a soul level. When I ignored the messages, my body escalated these messages to pain and illness until I finally started dealing with the emotional patterns that were stored there. As I developed more awareness and skill, questions and insights became easier. In the beginning, when I asked questions, I may or may not have received answers to those questions. Sometimes they weren't the right type of questions or I was thinking of or anxious about the answers. At the beginning, perhaps my awareness level was not opened or developed. I needed to trust myself for my intuition to develop further. Later, I realized I may not need that insight to release the pattern. If I just set the honest intention, visualized and felt divine love, certain energies would dissipate even if I didn't know all the answers. More insight and answers came the more I believed and trusted the process. Some of my symptoms included migraine headaches and over time, my headaches progressed to sharp pains in my chest, which further progressed to a stress leave with major depression and anxiety. The medications and therapy I received didn't release my underlying emotional baggage from the past and my body further escalated it to cancer. This is literally what Summer described in the past section when referring to Dr. John Sarno's term, the symptom imperative. My body was literally screaming at me to acknowledge and deal with my past emotional patterns. As I practiced opening my heart and being connected to divine love and light and practiced identifying and releasing layers of heavy, dense energy of negative emotional patterns, I noticed my physical energy returning and my pain subsiding and eventually leaving. 
I no longer have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. My emotional and mental states started changing as well. That negative ongoing chatter in my head from my ego self who judged and put myself and others down lessened and quieted. As I set the intention to change my way of thinking and to change my perspective, rather than listening to my ego mind, I could actually feel happy again. Glimpses at first, but as I kept transforming negative patterns and judgments into love, those happy moments extended and came more often. As emotional baggage from my past was lifted out of me, my soul self emerged more and more. I noticed how each of my family members started changing as I changed. My husband and I had been fighting for years, but as I released the anger and resentment I had towards him, I became aware of how it really came from my childhood. As I let those emotions go, our relationship healed. All of my relationships became healthier and I started becoming more open, honest, and communicating more effectively. My confidence and self-esteem levels dramatically increased. My whole personal vibration changed from low, dense, heavy negative energies of shame, guilt, anger, sadness and blame to a higher vibrational states of love, compassion, peace, gratitude, and taking full responsibility for the life I had created. I became happy about life again and learned to care for and love myself more. An added bonus to removing my emotional baggage and tuning into love was that I started connecting more into my own inner wisdom and guidance, my own intuitive nature. I became more aware of my own truth and became more aligned to my authentic soul self. I can shine my light and love into the world in my own unique way. The magical element that produced all of this transformation is the energy of love. We are all spiritual beings of love and light residing in physical bodies. This soul part of us is full of wisdom, peace, calmness, acceptance, and gratitude. It is the essence of our true authentic self. This love is unconditional, non-judgmental, and accepting of all that is, regardless of circumstance or situation. Each of us has this unconditional love within us. It is who we are on a soul level. It is the divinity that is in with each of us. It just is. These women's stories are big life transitions and wake-up calls. What each of these women had in common was a calling towards something more meaningful in life, a purpose beyond what they were currently experiencing, and their emotional and physical symptoms were their calling cards. The pain they experienced stripped them down to their essence before they could live a more soul-aligned life. What migraines can tell you? Other wake-up calls come in all forms. One of them is a migraine headache. Migraines are specific and local to a particular immediate life situation or stress. They are painful and as a result, full of opportunity for expanded awareness. For example, I was at a health conference and a colleague came to me asking what I did for migraines. She was experiencing the onset of one and asked for my assistance. I explained some physical aids such as peppermint oil and lavender, but told her it was most important to explore the emotional reason behind the onset of the headache. Being a hypnotherapist, she felt quite confident in her abilities to recognize her unconscious triggers, so we explored the physical energy to guide us there. I asked her to tell me the specific physical symptoms of her migraine. She explained the visual auras she was experiencing and the beginnings of nausea and that with this particular migraine, she felt it in her back. Experiencing part of the migraine in her back was not usual, so I suggested we focus there. 
We could have explored the energy she felt in her back through the process of inside out. But being in the middle of a conference hall, I went with my intuition and years of experience that told me it may have something to do with having a backbone and standing up for herself. As soon as I mentioned what I sensed the meaning of her back pain was, tears began to roll down her face. Ah, I said, I think we've just found the unconscious trigger for your migraine. She went on to tell me that she'd just been in the conference hall and overheard someone speaking about her knowledge without crediting her for it. And she had not said anything despite feeling a sense of betrayal. I suggested she go lay on the earth, close her eyes and integrate this knowledge and decide what she wanted to do about it. 20 minutes later, she returned to let me know her migraine had subsided. She felt back to normal and could resume her work at her booth in the health conference. As for myself, as for myself, I had full-blown migraines into my early 30s. My last two started the same way as all the others. Numbness, nausea, and visual impairment. But I was able to stop the progression by accessing the emotional prelude through the process of inside out. From the first onset of the symptoms to the relief and feeling able to resume normal functioning lasted no longer than two hours instead of three days. Most migraine sufferers can identify with my experience, but what they may not know is that with most migraines, there is an emotional prelude, an internal pressure that is built up. A head ache means that we are overutilizing our head or thinking too much. It is a sign that we need to access our body's senses and engage other forms of awareness. The process of inside out is a simple but effective way for accessing this awareness that has profound effects. Simply put, the process requires that we remain present to the feelings and physical sensation the migraine presents or other types of symptoms or illnesses. Then we explore, accept, and follow their trail to the underlying cause. Once we understand the nature of the conflict that precipitates the migraine or other disease, the progression of the migraine stops. Yes, stops. The pain and nausea subside and deep restful sleep follows. There are no torturous days of agony or the need to throw up. Please note that in the beginning of my own awakenings, I did not trust my intuitions or even know how to distinguish my thoughts and mind from intuition. When people begin to work with the process of inside out or any other type of intuitive work, it's natural to begin to build a sense of trust in one's intuition, visions, and in the overall process over time. Like anything, experience and practice builds confidence. For a more thorough explanation of the simple and natural process of inside out, the concepts, skills, and process See chapter six. And in the full version of the audiobook in chapter seven, you will have access to a link for the PDF companion workbook pages to download. Chapter three of Soul Side Out The Health Scare System. What is healing? How I was shown the universal laws and principles of healing has a lot to do with my personal experience of life and work. And what I knew was not healing. The idea or belief that we must fight or kill whatever invades our body or cut out dysfunctional parts is not healing. Instead, it is a fear-based culture of care. Fear pervades our North American healthcare system, both on psychological and medical levels. As such, I refer to it as the health scare system. Footnote. I had a few of my favorite people tell me to avoid coining this term because it was inflammatory or might be offensive. I would like to clarify that by creating the term the health scare system, I do not mean that the current health system is not useful, only that one might recognize that it is ultimately a business 
and its marketing is, in fact, fear-based. As for myself, if I break my arm or get hit by a bus, I use the medical system. I am not advocating an alternative to the medical system. What I am advocating is a form of complementary care. I advocate using and navigating all forms of care available to us when we are sick or unwell. In the context of our health care system, we are taught a veil or wall separates the body and emotions. There is psychology and then there is the practice of medicine. One is for the emotions and the other for the body and the fear of their integration is high. How did we end up here? Currently, the Western Globe's culture, science, and medicine are founded upon the interpretation of Sir Isaac Newton's scientific discoveries, the portion of Newtonian science that is used most rigorously. The scientific method was and still is used without the sacred intent that Isaac Newton himself employed. Unfortunately, it was not his science that humanity embraced but a truncated version of his thoughts that served to support those in power. In all likelihood, Sir Isaac Newton did not separate his science from the overarching power of creation or of God. Sir Isaac Newton was first and foremost a theologian and a spiritual man. Because humanity was not ready for his discoveries in their totality, their efforts were only partially put to use. For more on Sir Isaac Newton, I encourage the viewing of the DVD, Newton's Dark Secrets, from 2003. Much of what he discovered was considered heresy and punishable by death. The truncated understanding of Newton's science led to some advancements in medicine and physical well-being on some levels, but also created an inner psychological culture of speed pressure and need for control, mirroring the outer culture of efficiency and productivity. People are in a hurry to know, to have answers to plan and solve. We want more data, more ideas. We want them faster and we want them to tell us clearly what to do. Claxton, 1997. Since the truncated version of Newton's laws were formalized in 1687, our culture and science as we've been taught it has been characterized by information gathering, intellect and impatience, which create an insensitive and hostile environment. And as we have come to learn and seek to wield external power consciously, we have come to view feelings as unnecessary appendages, like tonsils, useless but capable of creating pain and dysfunction. Thus, the pursuit of external power has led to the repression of emotion. Zukov, 1989. The deliberate avoidance or control of our innermost resources, our emotions and connection to the greater source of life is insanity. But as a culture, we have not recognized it as such. How does the mind induce physical pain? Although there are a number of ways the brain can induce symptoms in the body, Dr. Sarno says that the largest number of psychosomatic conditions can be tracked to the repression of emotion through the autonomic peptide branch of the central nervous system. Sarno, 2006. Peptides are molecules that participate in a system of intercommunication between the brain and the body. Many types of physical pain are caused by mild and benign, meaning harmless, oxygen deprivation to a specific area of the body and brought on by stress through the central nervous system. The activity of the autonomic peptide branch of the central nervous system controls involuntary systems such as circulatory, gastrointestinal, and geroturinary systems. It is active 24 hours a day and functions outside of our conscious awareness. 
The altered physiology in the process that creates the symptoms and physical pain appears to be a mild, localized reduction in blood flow to a small region or specific body structure, such as a spinal nerve, resulting in a state of mild oxygen deprivation. The result is pain. The tissues that may be targeted by the brain include the muscles of the neck, shoulders, back or buttocks, or any spinal or peripheral nerve and any tendon. As a consequence, the symptoms may occur virtually anywhere in the body. Sarno, 2006. Although it's true that symptoms arise anywhere in the body, in my experience, the mind is not random in its choice of where or how the pain or symptom is experienced. Symptoms are often a precise metaphorical reflection of the underlying psychic, spiritual, or emotional conflict the person is experiencing. For example, as I mentioned earlier, I suffered for years with excruciating migraines. In the past, they proceeded into debilitating illness. White hot ice picks of pain ceaselessly thrust their way into my head. Accompanied with left side numbness, an inability to speak, and waves of nausea that lasted for two to three days, for, for two to three days until I threw up. During my early 30s, one of my migraines affected vision in one eye and one side of my head. However, as I began developing my creative, intuitive skills and knowledge, I learned how to process the meaning and unconscious trigger behind the physical migraine symptoms. Processing pain through the laws of inside out allowed me to short circuit the migraine's effects. As I turned into the energy of the migraine, I received the message that I had turned a blind eye. I instantly understood what that meant to me and I acknowledged the conflict I'd felt. My husband insisted that I work while my daughter was very young. During my migraine, the remorse and separation I felt when I left her in a day home surfaced. As soon as I set my mind to remove my daughter from daycare, the oxygen deprivation from the onset of the unconscious emotional conflict subsided and I quickly recovered. Now I use the same process with others. These disorders, symptoms, migraines, and other illnesses afflict millions and cost the economy billions of dollars every year in medical expenses, compensation payments, etc. The cost on the economy is large. The human cost is greater. The cost to some is their way of life. Similarly, some surgeries do more harm than good, and the side effects of many types of pharmaceuticals are irreversible. Beyond the physical reality of pain and other symptoms, social emotional aspects keep many trapped in a perpetual cycle of illness that could be reversed through simple awareness and education. When we experience some kind of physical pain, it's typical in our Western world to have a fearful thought such as something's wrong, I'm sick or I'm dying or I might have cancer and I need to fix this. Now, Imagine the kind of goose chase you can get into when you attempt to apply the medical model. The goose chase for some physical cause can keep people preoccupied and possibly obsessed with their physical health and emotionally unconscious for years. Not many of us are prone to saying, oh, I have a repressed thought or feeling, something I'm not paying attention to and it's causing oxygen deprivation to such and such part of my body. So I should ask it what's up. 
This sounds remarkably simple, and in theory it is. Depending on the origin of the emotion, on the time continuum of your life, often it really can be this simple. The work comes in undoing the layers of fear-based belief and familial patterns if the symptom is familial and intergenerational. Symptoms, illness, and disease that are embedded in the unconscious matrix of generations are a little more complex than a migraine brought upon by a local stressor, such as my daughter's chosen care provider. Nevertheless, the same process of discovery can unwind the stranglehold that our old ways of thinking have when carried on in the younger generations. Our outdated mental health care system. During my 30s, I trained at three and worked in two different hospitals. During one of my practicums for my master's program, I got a chance to develop and implement some art therapy programming. My experiences at the hospitals were shocking and drove me clear away from allopathic and institutional medicine. The methods used in some wards of hospitals are barbaric. Psychiatric units dull and drug people and continue to use electric shock therapies. We might as well still be head, hang, or torture people. At the psychiatric unit. Early in my practicum on the psychiatric unit, I was aghast at some staff conversations. The unit was known as a revolving door because many of the clients would return again and again. I'm sure underneath the outside banter, some of the staff ultimately felt quite helpless. I'm quite sure they did not go into healthcare to see people harmed or sick or to be ineffective at preventing them from coming back. I was invited to do some art therapy programming on this unit. My group included suicidal patients hospitalized for the severity of their thoughts and behaviors. Considering the depths of these patients' inner struggles, it seemed deplorable that there was no psychologist on staff. The goal was to assist clients in exploring different themes and aspects of their life and thinking, such as risk-taking, control, and grief. I admired the raw authenticity of these clients. They had nothing to lose, nothing to hide anymore, and I found it refreshing. They simply didn't give a shit. I would like to share one simple but profound incident that occurred during one of our weekly sessions. On this particular day, with thick oil pastels, the patients were drawing how they were feeling. One client drew a black box and immediately began experiencing a panic attack. As the patients were closely monitored, this person exclaimed their need to leave to get their anti-anxiety medication from their room. I asked gently where they might be feeling the sense of panic, and the client immediately indicated that they felt it in their heart area, in their chest. It appeared in their mind's eye as very black, and this person began to breathe very quickly. I asked if I could touch their back, and when they responded positively, I put one hand on their back between their shoulder blades, behind the heart and ask them to breathe gently and watch. Breathing with their attention in their heart area, they watched. As they did, the black area in their mind's eye turned to gray, and as their breathing slowed, it changed into bright yellow. They were generally surprised by the shift, and that's when they spontaneously remembered a repressed memory about their father. As there was no psychologist on the unit, one of the full-time staff members found support for the client to pursue the integration of her memory, and we purchased a couple of yellow shirts to remind them of the yellow, the hope, and the release. This opportunity to be present to their body and release a forgotten memory would have been lost had this person taken the anti-anxiety medication to stop what was being experienced. The African and shamanic view of mental illness. 
The African or shamanic view of mental illness is very different. In the shamanic view, Maladoma Patrice Somme says that mental illness signals the birth of a healer. What the West views as mental illness, the Dagara people regard as good news from the other world. The person going through the crisis has been chosen as a medium for the message to the community that needs to be communicated from the spirit realm. Mental disorder and behavioral disorders of all kinds signal the fact that two obviously incompatible energies have merged into the same field, says Dr. Somme. One of the things Dr. Somme encountered when he first came to the United States in 1980 for graduate study was how the West deals with mental illness. When a fellow student was sent to a mental institution due to nervous depression, Dr. Somme went to visit him. I was so shocked. That was the first time I was brought face to face with what is done here to people exhibiting the same symptoms I've seen in my village. What struck Dr. Somme was that the attention given to such symptoms was based on pathology on the idea that the condition is something that needs to stop. This was in complete opposition to his culture. As he looked around the stark ward at the patients, some in straitjackets, some zoned out on medications, and others screaming, he observed to himself. So this is how the healers who are attempting to be born are treated in this culture. What a loss. What a loss that a person who is finally being aligned with the power from the other world is just being wasted. The Western world is not trained in how to deal with it, nor are they taught to acknowledge the existence of psychic phenomena or the spiritual world. Instead, psychic abilities are denigrated. When energies from the spirit world emerge in a Western psyche, that individual is completely unequipped to integrate them or even recognize what's happening. The result can be terrifying. Without the proper context for and assistance in dealing with the breakthrough from another level of reality, for all intensive purposes, the person is insane. Heavy dosing with antipsychotic drugs compounds the problem and prevents the integration that could lead to soul development and growth in the individual who has received these energies. Without the proper context for and assistance in dealing with the breakthrough from another level of reality, for all practical purposes, the person is insane. Heavy dosing with antipsychotic drugs compounds the problem and prevents the integration that could lead to soul development and growth in the individual who has received these energies. This is an excerpt from the Natural Medicine Guide to Schizophrenia or the Natural Medicine Guide to Bipolar Disorder by Stephanie Moran, 2003, featuring Maladoma Patrice Somme. The chasm between the Western view of mental illness and that of earth-based or shamanic cultures is vast. The shame, guilt, and social stigma that comes from the Western viewpoint creates such a denigration of the human spirit. To be fearful of symptoms, that are normal and natural within a different paradigm of thought is, in my opinion, one of the biggest atrocities and wars taking place on our planet. From psychology to humanology. Several of my friends and colleagues are psychologists, having worked with them during my training. Many recognize that psychology is not complete in itself, and many take further training like Hakomi, which is a Buddhist form of body-centered psychotherapy, art therapy, play therapy, EMDR, somatic training, or NLP, which is neuro-linguistic programming, or one of many other supplemental modalities that engage a deeper level of mind and body than just talk therapy. Many professionals recognize working with people requires a more compassionate human connection. 
our system and governmental funding policies don't tend to really address human evolution and the true needs of the souls on this planet. It is my recommendation that people take total charge of their own health without relying on a system or government to tell them what is best for them. Once, when speaking to a 20-some-year-old with an addiction issue, I laughed uncontrollably when they told me their thoughts about the profession of psychology. In a very offhanded and casual way, they said that psychologists are paid to judge people. What made it so funny was that it's based in an undeniable truth. When working as part of a governmental institution, psychologists are mandated to diagnose and categorize according to the latest diagnostic and statistical manual, the DSM. If you've ever read one of these, you may notice that it provides a definition of the disorders, but is absolutely nothing in regards to what A, causes them or b what to do about them the dsm is simply a type of categorization most often used to slot people into certain areas of funding money and treatment is not provided unless people are given one of these labels so by applying a label to a client people working for government institutions get paid Unfortunately, this creates another whole area of psychological anxiety. For many people, such labels promote low self-esteem and separation from the universal level of their experience. Addendum to Chapter 3 in the audio version of Soul Side Out. Many people are experiencing major life transitions and awakenings. You may be experiencing highly charged emotions, be crying often, feel angry or irritable, be woken by high energy dreams, experience flashbacks of traumas and or spontaneous thoughts or images may pop into your head. You may be unable to work and may be experiencing weird or painful body sensations, sleeplessness, or blurred vision. You may have an increasing feeling of the mundane or meaninglessness and wishing for more purpose in life. I'm here to tell you in this addendum that all these symptoms, these feelings, these experiences are natural. These symptoms and this confusion or judgment that you're having about what you're experiencing is much like what we talked about in chapter three in the outdated mental health scare system. We are undergoing a major worldwide human consciousness shift. The stressors, fears, and circumstances you may find yourself in are not unlike the earth-based culture's initiations or vision quests that they deliberately had their men and women go through to discover their own gifts. The purpose of it is for you to be able to discover who you truly are. This is an exceptional time, an exceptional time where we are waking up to all sorts of new awarenesses, realms, and abilities, and opening up the other 95% of our mind and our brain, which I'm going to talk about in the next few chapters. We are awakening to our potential, to our higher selves, to our souls, to what we have been asleep to for the last several hundreds of years. The purpose of all of this is so that people can see and feel and reconnect to those things that are most important to the very life essence of who they are. The aspect of your being that is timeless, that is universal, is your soul. It will carry you through anything that you are currently experiencing to new insight and profound life meaning. It's reconnecting us to what is most important to our being. That includes love. It also includes connection to the earth itself, to your higher self, to spirit, to God, to the creator, and to other human beings on the planet, to your loved ones, to your family. And this process, although it may seem scary, 
frightening and unknown to you at the time, it is completely natural. It's not unlike near-death experiences where people are able to access different realms of awareness that provide profound insight. The only difference is that the death is not of the body, but of the ego or personality and of the coping mechanisms that you've been using, thoughts or beliefs that no longer serve you. You may have tried to ignore your emotions and been under extreme stress, and you may not be able to process your experiences. Because your defenses have been torn or stripped away, you have an opening. It may feel like a jagged crack or tear in your heart, faith, spirit, or soul, but that same hole is the opening to divine source. It really is good news. And you are now what I call a sincere soul searcher, open to new sense of meaning and direction in your life. You no longer want to wear any false masks. You don't care about surface appearances, and it feels exhausting to pretend otherwise. In this space that seems like total exhaustion, where you feel you may give in or give up, you have access to a special form of awareness that will guide you. The same energy that causes all symptoms you are experiencing will give you direction, guidance, and insight beyond your wildest imagination. In this state that is confusion and chaos at first, a powerful connection to the universal energy field of human awareness awakens. I call this space, this time, the transformation threshold Everything that you knew and believed on the surface with your relationships, your roles, your personality, your culture that you grew up in is able to shift. Using the laws inherent in healing, you have access to the divine energy of your soul and can begin to heal at the source and from the inside out. If this sounds like you right now and you're ready to dive into more meaning, you're ready to explore to give up the meaninglessness, the masks, the charade that often is on the surface of our Western world and delve into the magic of your inner realm that the creator has for you. If you are done with the pretending, if you are exhausted, if you are sick, if you are even just wondering if there is something more meaningful, more joyful, more fun, Use the link below to access the rest of the full audio version of the book. Join us in one of our mind, body, soul, medicine, immersion classes in Inside Out, or feel free to contact me directly and book a 45 minute breakthrough call where we will go through exactly what's blocking you from living your best life. Dedication and Acknowledgements. I would like to express my gratitude to St. Stephen's College instructors, its pedagogy for being the gem in the rough of our society that allowed my healing and any of this book to be possible. Thank you, particularly to my instructor, Marjorie LaPlante and Lorraine Nicely, the matriarchs that forged the way for the rest of us. To my mother, who is always ever so generous in her financial support and her unconditional generosity. To my daughter, one of my greatest teachers, a wise being behind her now 14 years. She lives and breathes this book every day, and I am beyond grateful for her presence and wisdom. To my dear friend, Jean Mitchell, for knowing me since I began my own soul journey, for being the editor of my master's thesis, which is the foundation for this book. To Linda Verde, my book editor, who is more than an editor, who is more than an editor. She is a coach and a co-creator, a person who strengthened my message through guidance and clarity. And to Petro Remy, who gently nudged me to hire Linda and who played devil's advocate while reading the initial format of my book. To Jesse Carrier, my accountability partner who holds me through relationship to match my words with my intention and my soul's purpose, Masicho. 
To my friends, Laura Graham and David Whalen, who invested in my gifts and gave me very practical and uplifting advice. To my friend and physician, Dr. Deborah Andrews, for the wisdom and unconditional support given to my growth, healing, and in writing of this book. To Deanne Riendo, the visionary of your holistic earth for the conventions, speaking opportunities, and collaborative events that bring about the evolution of the healer soul. For my friends, Winnie Lau, Roseanne Jansen, and Christine Panessa, the world is forever enriched by the unique ways you show up in the world and, in particular, in my world and in my heart. For Dr. Neil Tran and Sylvia Shefizik, and the kindness and open-hearted way you received me and encouraged my own intuitive gifts and healing capacities as a collaborative colleague at the West Edmonton Naturopathic Wellness Center. And finally, for the soul searchers, I have met so many beautiful souls that have crossed my path, that have graced me with the trust to witness their transformations. It is the magic I live for. Much gratitude also goes to the healers and the co-contributing authors that emerged in the process of this book. Olivia Cashman, Michelle Enns, Jillian Sidero, and Peggy Voth for your co-creative soulful exploration and playful banter that evolved the content of this book. For your vulnerability and clear articulation of the soul and the healing possibilities much of our world has yet to discover. Finally, I would like to thank the universal matrix that my soul belongs to for the direction I receive each day in the most magical way through divine guidance. I have been opened. I am open. I am ready to live and share this message. I accept. <laughs>